Are you at your point where you think you've hit your bottom or maybe that there's just no way you're ever going to feel like things can change? I was like that. I really was. And I want you to know, my name is Bromo, by the way. I want you to know that there is a way out. Please join us for my podcasts. Hey, y'all. Darius Rucker here. You know, a lot of people ask me, what inspires your music? And one of the big things is a strong sense of place. That's why I love my home state of South Carolina and want to share the awesome things it has to offer. From the beautiful mountains down to the sunny coast, it's got it all. Not to mention two of my personal favorites, great golf and amazing food. Come see why I love this place. Visit discoversouthcarolina.com. Here we go. All right. Look at that. It's the last day of January already. And yesterday I wrapped up my long, long, <laughs> long uh, share. I, I, My name is Bromo. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is 21709. You're listening to There Is A Way Out. Again, I am not a professional at this. I don't have any credentials or anything like that. Really, my strengths are experience and, and hope. And I shared my story for 13 episodes. And now my favorite time has come. My favorite time has come is now when I bring you on. I bring okay. uh, guests on. Yeah. Nicole, you just heard her in, in the background. I bring <laughs> guests on now where I let them share their story and their strength. I, I do this whole podcast for the hope that someone could be out there struggling with addiction uh, or a family member or a friend, and they've seen them go through the pain and the whirlwind of no hope. And there is hope. There is a way out. And my guest, my first guest and this new platform, I'm very excited to introduce Nicole Winans. And let me set this thing up real quick, Nicole, if I could, how we met, okay? Sure. And there she is. Say hi, Nicole. Hello. Look at that. She has a better voice than I do. And don't they all? <laughs> <laughs> don't they all? Uh, all, yeah, yeah, don't they all? It, it, it's <laughs> here's the thing, Nicole. A lot of us in the business don't like our our own voice, and we <laughs> and we cringe sometimes. So here's during the summertime, there was a uh, concert at Prairie Nights Casino Resort, one of my favorite places. And from here in Mandan, it's about a fifty minute drive. You go through the beautiful terra uh, countryside. You go through some twisting roads. You go through a re- Indian reservation, isn't that right, Nicole? Yes. And on that reservation, there's a feeling of peace, calm, and you go up the hill, turn left, and there's Prairie Nights. It's a beautiful place, and there I am setting up to do a remote. Uh, we're broadcasting live out there. For I think George Thorogood was playing that night. Yeah. And yeah, during the span of me setting up, I looked over and I saw, and I'm gonna explain this in a very polite way and i know you'll back me up on this but i looked yeah. over i saw a very uh let's just call him a very eager gentleman that had a little bit too much to drink and he was being escorted out uh, politely with respect and grace and one of the people that were walking him out talking to him and this gentleman was feeling his oats and he was polite as well, but he had way too much to drink, was Nicole. And she had a little suit on, and she talked to this guy, and they gingerly brought him outside. They want to bring him away from, you know, from the public, you know? And he's been there before, and you had told me later that this 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 man had, had has visited your place many times. And yeah. when I saw the way you handled him with such dignity, I went over, and we started talking. And the second I heard from you, when I, because if you know me of anybody, I blab too much and I tell everybody my life story within three minutes. And yeah. I showed Nicole my tattoo and she goes, Oh, I'm coming up on uh, how many years uh, sober? It's like 16, uh, how many? What, no, 20s. What is your sobri- Yeah, what is your sobriety date? January, right? Uh, January 14th, 1998. Right away. I met my hero, and I told her that. I said, look, I don't care even if George Thorogood walks by us at this point. I want a picture taken. Remember that, Nicole? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. And we took a picture, and I smiled, and I was standing next to 
another person a successful life, uh, going through life, going through the ups and downs. I didn't even know her story yet. But when she told me how long she's been sober, I said to myself, well, here's a conversation that's going to happen, whether it's going to be right now or later down the road. We talked for a couple of minutes and then you went off and did your job. And I, you could tell right away how much passion that I have for anybody who's turned their life around. Can't you? Yes. Tell me what you were thinking that moment you saw this goofy looking disc jockey, uh, asking you a thousand questions right away about your sobriety. Was I a pain in the neck? <laughs> no. I'm actually proud of you for coming out right away and telling me. Oh, I do do that a lot. You know, and that's the thing. Nobody, there's no uh, handbook that says, here's how you have to act once you stop drinking or once you've. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. W- once you've. You wing it. You wing it every day. Yeah. Once you've surrendered 100% and you're in the program or you're, you know, you're not in the program but you're 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 living the life of of sobriety. Yes. Uh, whether you go to AA meetings, whether you don't, um, it's your it's personal. So whether you tell yes. people or not, that's the beautiful thing. And I'm sure Nicole, in your life, and in your people around you, and your family, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. They know of your strength, don't they? Yes, they do. Why don't you tell everybody first of all? Do you mind? Uh, what age category you're in. You don't have to say exactly your age. Tell us a little I'm about, to, about I'm yourself. Proud, I'm proud to say it. I'm 52 years old. Excellent. Tell uh, tell everybody what you do and, and why I met you at Prairie Nights. What do you do there? I'm a security supervisor at Prairie Nights Casino. Which meant that, which means that you had dealt with that drunk person before, correct? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I used to also be in corrections, so now I get to see them before they go to jail. Isn't that great? Now, yeah. <laughs> how you told me through an article I wrote that growing up you wanted to pursue um, things like that, right? Yes. So tell us a little about by yourself. Where are you from? I'm. I was born and raised on um, Standing Rock. Um, I'm from Fort Berthold. That's um, up north, Newtown and White Shield. I'm from White Shield. A little t- is it a little uh, town? Yes. Okay. And so you grew up there, and you had a family, yes. I, I, I suppose? I was born and raised by my mother. Nice. And did you have any brothers uh, and sisters? Yes. Um, my mother remarried, and to that marriage, she had uh, my my brothers, my siblings, uh, Whitney, Jessica, Robert, Nico, and uh, Max. Now, when you were in your early age maybe before teens or even in your teens, when did you first uh, start seeing people drink or use or anything like that? Did it appeal to you right away? or Growing up, uh, you see a lot of it uh, everywhere. It's everywhere. everywhere. From the time I was, I was little, it, it, that's, that's all, that's all there, there is, is drinking. Now, the people that drank around you, they were people you see – neighbors and such and and oh. did that leave you with a feeling of that's sad or like is this all they can it, do or what was your feeling it, it, it was the normal it's the normal the normal yeah wow yeah. isn't that something so it's, it's not surprising i mean it's just it's just what you see it's every everywhere that's how some people cope with life a lot of people correct yes when did you first start thinking well let me uh you know what? Maybe I'm going to try drinking or whatever. What was your ch- What was your choice? What did you drink or did you use or what did you do? I I only um, I never dabbled in drugs, but I um, drinking was a big thing with me. Um, I think I started when I was like 16. Yeah, I sure and like. I, here's the thing, Nicole. I don't mean to interrupt, and I'm just going to yeah. lay this out there. I sure wish I was your your age, because then I can because then you and I. Then I could say, oh, yeah, I can relate to you. I'm a little yep. older than you. But what you just said was, and I'm sure you can probably nod your head and say, Prop, yeah, when I was, yeah, I am. I when am. I was I'm younger, I didn't see any drugs around. I saw pot maybe rarely yeah. here and there, but yeah. liquor was easy to get. So continue. Sorry yeah. about that, Nicole. No, no. It it was it was everywhere. I started when I was like 16, and I it was like every maybe – 
just going out with friends, then maybe we will drink. Yeah. Maybe maybe just do something fun or just hang out or whatever. But it was never really, I never really thought anything bad of it. It was just the normal. If they were drinking upstairs, we were downstairs drinking. And they didn't know we were drinking because they were drinking upstairs. <laughs> right. It, it was it was the it was the normal and it, the only thing we had a problem with is finding someone to buy it for, my, for right. us. So it really wasn't a big deal. It's not like nope. you were uh, hiding uh, some drug that's against the law. Liquor obviously is so wide open, and yeah. uh, it's almost like a given that someone's drinking. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So continue. So you started. Did you realize that when you were when you drank, you felt. Uh, I don't know, a little bit better about yourself, more confident, or you went along with the group? It was just like um, being a part of the crowd. That's yeah. actually what it was. Yeah. That's how a lot of people start, you know? You might not yeah, necessarily it. like it, but you're part of the crowd, right? Yeah, yeah. You when, didn't have to like it. It's just, <laughs> if you had a beer in your hand, you were cool. So <laughs> when did you drift off and kind of drink by yourself, and when did you start realizing, you know, you know what? This is part of my life now. I'm drinking a little bit more, and it's great. Did you start doing that a little bit after you're 16 or 16 years old, or whenever? Um, I think when um, I realized um, it wasn't so cool was when I was a senior in high school, and we were actually drunk in school. Oh boy! And, yeah, uh, running from the teachers and the principal and anybody that was trying to look for us. Now, did your mom ever find out? Uh, no, she had a drinking problem and she was working and when she wasn't at work, she was, they were, they were partying too. Yeah. So now this is what I, I want people to really hear. So this is part of your family. Your mom drank. So there's yeah. really, even if she knew you were drinking, it's part of the, part of the family. It's part of, uh, yeah. what's, what's around. It's part of your lifestyle, right? Yeah. She didn't realize I was drinking and it didn't matter to me because Everybody thought she was cool because we were coming in and out, and we were half shot, and they were all partying. And you know what? Certainly, there's nothing to worry about, right? With both parties, yeah. no. Why well, worry about my daughter? I'm drinking. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so you get a little bit older, and you start realizing, hey, you know what? Drinking is part of my life. Did you ever, at one point, say to yourself, "I wonder if this is going to get worse"? Did you ever see anybody else get worse? I never, when I, um, after high school, when, after I graduated, I started working at the police department and I was, um, 18, oh, about a month before my 19th birthday. And, um, one of my, um, mom's friends told me he was a chief of police and he said, let me take care of her. Let me show her like something better. And I start working at the police department as a um, dispatcher. So, so they, he had, he saw you and said, "Let me show you a different kind of." Yeah, uh, I had oh. interest. Yeah, my my grandmother came home one day when she was working at tribal court and said, "If you want to learn something here, learn this." And she gave me the ten codes, and I never really understood what the ten codes were right. until um, my mom's friend took me into the police department and I started dispatching. And I was like, "Oh, okay, I know all these ten codes," and so I started dispatching. But I never really had a, it kept my mind away from it kind of led me to another path, yeah, where my friends kept going on that same path where yeah. I was headed, but here I was getting into law enforcement and starting to follow in my mother and my grandmother's footsteps. They worked on tribal court side, I worked on the police department side, so that's what caught my interest was that, and that's where I start leading away being guided away from the bad path that my friends all followed and they all followed that. I have, a, I have a quick question. When you were working with the police department back then, did you ever have somebody come over and go, Hey, Nicole, I got a ticket two days ago. Do you think you can fix that? <laughs> no, but I actually booked and lodged a lot of relatives. Oh boy. We're, really? We're very, very respectful, but they hated me at the time. But afterwards they, I gained a lot of respect. But you're still drinking, correct? Yes, I was still drinking. Now, it was a different group of people. It wasn't my high school friends. It was a uh, different group. Yeah, a different group, an older group. So you worked at, at the evidence department, right? Yes, we had access to the evidence room. 
at one point, though, when did you start feeling yourself stray a little bit as far as, hmm, maybe I can do something in the evidence department? Did you tell me you were uh, taking some things here and there? Um, yeah, that was a one-in-a-lifetime one experience that I'll never, ever um, recommend to anybody uh, stealing out of the evidence room because, one, you don't know. I didn't know at the time alcohol expires, and um, that's not a great tasting alcohol. <laughs> now, I, I guess I should have asked you this prior before the interview, but are you okay that I brought that up? Because yeah, I that's rem- fine. That's fine. No, okay. I'm, I'm honest. I'm honest. And, and this is, folks, this is what you're going to hear from Nicole until we finish the interview. 100% honesty. And in my mind, 100% honesty, honesty is surrendering to alcoholism and addiction. So, continue. You were stealing from the evidence. Did you get caught at one point, or what happened? No. No, we didn't get caught. It just it was the worst tasting alcohol I've ever had in my life. Oh, boy. Like like, like any kind of like homemade booze and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, you realize at that point, you know, maybe I'm getting into drinking a little bit more now. Yeah. It, it just left a bitter taste in my mouth that uh, in in my head, too, so. Um, I, I'll never do that ever again. Did you feel like it was taking control of your life? Yeah. I I, I looked in the mirror and I said, damn, it's come to this. Wow. Isn't that something? So did you think to yourself, uh, yeah, maybe I should try stopping or did that ever come? Yeah, and I'll bet you at that point you didn't think you had a problem. You just kind of looked yeah, at yourself. Yeah, I didn't. And, yeah. I did. I just, every now and then, I... I um, started drowning myself in work. I just um, kept working, 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 and keeping my mind occupied. And then I'm like, well, they want to go out, so I'll just go out and have a few. And then it just it's just continuous like that. It's just every now and then I drink. It, and then I, I found that my mind was occupied, so I just keep working. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I hate to use that pun, but it's so true with a lot of people. You drown yourself in work, correct? You drown yes. yourself in staying yes. busy, right? Yes. And the I, I, ironic thing is when you're sober, um, they always say idle time is the yes. death knell. I, idle time takes a lot of people down um, when they're you know, either a couple days sober or a couple years sober and they're not um, staying confident with the program or staying confident with their sobriety. Idle time is a death. It, it, could, it could cause and it does cause some people to drink. All right. So so. So you're doing that for a while. Now, wasn't there a period when you stopped for about three or four years? I think you told me. Yes. Um, back in, I think it was the early 90s, I was sober. I was going on three years. I was like a month shy of three years, and um, we found out my mom had lupus. Let us uh, let me r- rewind just a tad. Why did okay. you stop? Did you go, hey, maybe I deserve a chance to stop? Maybe I should. Maybe I, maybe I don't. Maybe I don't need booze anymore, and I can stop. That's and you like, stop. Is that what you? Is that what that's happened? That's exactly exactly what it was. Is it's like I don't. Yeah, it doesn't. Why wake up with a hangover? Yeah. Um, it, it just didn't feel feel uh, fun fun anymore. It wasn't fun anymore. See, I uh, I find that fascinating because never in my span of my career of drinking. Um, was there ever a phase where I said to myself, I'm going to stop for a year or two because it wasn't possible. So for you to stop for a little bit was pretty incredible to, to stay sober. Now, I know some people, the quarterback, uh, couch quarterbacks might say, oh, then she's really not an alcoholic. No, nobody should label that yes or no. She just, just decided at that point that, you know what, maybe I don't need it. And yeah. But that was still in the back of your mind, wasn't it? Because you relapsed, correct? Because you you found your mom was sick, right? Well, see, I, I, I want to back that up a little bit. Yeah, please. Okay, when when um, I was drinking between when I was uh, 16, well, 18, until I was 21, I was drinking in bars. Yeah. People knew my parents. People knew who I was and where I worked. Yeah. So they allowed me to drink in the bars. And have a beer at the bar. They probably and, encouraged you. Yeah, it, it, it was it was nothing. I mean, it was it was like grown up. To me, it, I was I was being a grown up. Yeah. But when I became when I turned twenty one, it was like no fun anymore. I mean, I, I was at that time. To me, it was um, more of the mind because I'm allowed to go into the bar and drink, but it was no more fun for me. Yeah. So 
why why do it anymore? So well, I, just, I, I I can totally get what you're saying. So I just I just quit, and it was going on three years. And one day, my mom, because I lived right across the street from my mom, and she walked in, and she said, uh, she was diagnosed with lupus. And my sister and my, my aunt, my mom's younger sister, were taking it very hard because lupus is a... Back then, it was like a real bad thing. Yeah. And uh, it's like a... To them, it was like a death sentence. And and they were taking it to heart. They were drinking and they were boozing. And so I had to be the the um, the rock for them. But once they got over it, and they were okay with it, and then I lost it. And then I fell off again. Now, take me back to your thoughts in your head. And I know that you can remember this. What was your feeling when you took that first drink back? Did you say to yourself, well, here I am back. I'm back. Were you in such a state of despair that, you know, you're like, eh, I don't like to cuss on my um, podcast. I don't think it's cool I at did. all. But I'm sure you said, ah, F it or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. <clears throat> I said, um. I told myself that I was going to lose my mom, and yeah. that's it. it. Yeah, I mean, you're. I think at that point, your mind, your mentality is going. Let's let's try and take me back to that state I was in when I was drinking. I, whatever we all remember when we relapse, and we 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 will never forget it, which is a great thing. I think our mind always keeps us on our toes on that. So, when you went, how long did you drink for a while? Uh, okay, let's talk about this. How old is your mom? She is 72. Okay. Now, she was drinking as well throughout that whole time, correct? Yes. Now, when you approached your sobriety date of January 14th, 1998, I believe you told me, and that's correct, isn't it? 1998? Yes. I believe yes. you told me you were coming to the point where you said, I'm done. I'm done with this whole thing. I don't want this anymore. Isn't that isn't that kind of what you said? Yeah. It 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 um woke me up. I just woke up one morning and well, I woke up that day. It was a day. It was my grandmother's birthday, January fourteenth. Yeah. And um, me and my sister were uh, decided, which was never good to. to sit down and have a few yeah. with each other. We've never, we don't, we, we're we distant. We have different fathers, so I guess that's a, a sibling thing. But we decided to drink together that day, and it was a bad idea. Yeah. At 3 p.m., I took my last drink, and I said, I, I can't do this anymore. And as the days went by, and the months went by, and the years went by, I think that you told me that at one point your mom, who yep. was who's your best friend and your father, I think you said, is that correct? Your best friend and your father figure? Yeah, she's my father figure, my mother figure, yep. Your best, best friend. friend. What's her name? She's my hero. She's my hero. Cassie Buffalo Boy Dancing Bull. Uh, she became Facebook friends with me, which I love, and tell her thank you for that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> tell all your friends, by the way, they're so welcome to be part of there is a way yeah. out. I hope you tell them. I, I have. I oh, have. good. Um, your mother looked up to you and saw the strength and probably saw a new sprinkle in your eye of a new life, a new life that you were kind of kicking back in. Your mom stopped drinking. Yes. That's amazing. All I can remember is it's in, in March. And um, I think it actually, I think it's 18 years this year. Yeah. It's, it's going to be 18 years this year. Yeah. She's been sober. Wow. Because I got, I got like eight years ahead of her. So I got a good <laughs> eight years going on her. But yeah, we, we do a lot together. We do everything together. She's my best friend. She's my hero. Uh, I'll do anything for her. Yeah. You know what? My, my mom was, I don't know if you could relate to this, but uh, when my mom was alive, she was the kind of woman that would be in the swimming pool and she'd scoop out a bee so it wouldn't drown and the bee would sting her hand and <laughs> my mom did such wonderful things and uh, you know I, I i hope she's looking down at me going yeah she you... is she's proud of you she's proud of you looking down saying when are you gonna get a haircut you bum or things like that <laughs> but that's my son down there the dopey yeah. looking the dopey looking disc jockey 
<laughs> what your mom went through was your mom watched you change your life around. And your yeah, mom, kept, your mom wanted kept, a piece of that. Your mom yeah. took you, and you were you still your mom's idol, I'm sure. Yeah, um, I said I, we always say when we're by ourselves, we look at each other, and she, I said, look at how far we come. And she said, I'm so proud of us. And I said, yeah, I am too. I'm so thankful you don't drink anymore. And she said, I'm so thankful you don't drink anymore because I guess I'm, I guess I was really a mean person. <laughs> well, you know, it's hard to tell when we're drinking yeah. and, and until we start hearing stories from other other people, oh, you know? Yeah. What I love so much about just this part, this isolated part with you and your mom, is the fact that your mom had said, you know, I, Nicole is such a huge part of my life and an example of how you can stop and you you can there is a way out and yes. you showed it to your mom and now she's riding that wonderful journey of being sober and what you guys now are doing is you're spreading that sobriety chain all around like you told me that you have nephews and and, and friends and people that look up to you yes i do isn't that and they don't look up to you for back then when you were working with the police department and such and such which is boy by the way awesome for anybody who works the police department <laughs> I looked up. I look up to anybody who works for the military and police department. But what you do now is you go to this beautiful place like Prairie Nights. You put on that awesome outfit that you wear. You got your name tag on. You walk around high, mighty, and sober. <laughs> yes, isn't that awesome? That I'm sure the people that work with you, you got to be one of their icons over there in that place. How long have you been there now, Prairie? I just um, got my ten year. Um, Star Quilt. Isn't that cool? I'm sure you meet a lot of people there, too. Oh, yes, I have. I have. So, uh, when your mom and you get together now, and should you guys go to a bar or anything like that, the cool thing is people won't even come over and try to slide you a drink because they know you're sober. And, and maybe they'll say to themselves, hey, maybe I should back off on the drinking, or maybe I should do a uh, check on my on my own inventory and see if I drink too much. Yes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yep. I um one of my aunties um uh, <laughs> tell you a little story. My um my auntie suggested well being beans in chili is really bad for me, but um she suggested that you get a can of beer and put it in there. Yeah. And it will make make you make you less gassy. So here's my mom making the chili <clears throat> she makes makes two pots and she says, Okay, now go out to the bar and get a can of beer. Them sons of guns would not sell me a can of beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know your mom. No, no, um, oh. I'm not call your mom. No, no, no. Honest to God, she's the one that sent me out here to get a can of beer. They would not sell me a can of beer. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. And and even if, even if they did, they they they, they knew you weren't going to take it away and drink. Although yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, it's awesome that people are concerned and yep. still still got their eye on you because you know just like I know that um, we can slip at any time. You know the dangers yes. of that. Yes. Um, I had, I think the the hardest time was when I lost my siblings, and that was, uh, but I I made it through. I you want to talk through. about that real quick? Because I saw there's a beautiful picture uh, that I put on a story. If anybody ever wants to read one of my stories, they can go to the walleye, 96.5, com and they can look up my goofy uh, face, and they can they can... <laughs> They can scroll down some of the stories that we write here. We write two stories every weekday, and I wrote a story about Nicole, and I chose that picture with all the color and, and everything for the cover. And you wanna, do you want to talk about that at all, or are you okay? Sure, sure. Um, uh, I think the toughest times was when, um, in 2018, uh, my sister, uh, she was Down syndrome, and she got really sick. And she got double pneumonia. She ended up in a hospital yeah. um, for 12 days. And on on, on that last day, she um, she passed away. Yeah. And she was just minutes away from my my grandmother, who was also very sick in California. And just minutes within yeah. each other, they passed away. Yeah. And um, it was it was a tough time then because I had to be really strong for my mom because she's always the strong one. And I had to, uh, we had to flip it, and I had to be her rock, because uh, losing a, a child is really hard. And 
this past uh, September, um, I lost my my brother. And I wasn't here. Me and my my mom weren't here when it happened. Um, he he had fallen, and um, a couple days before that, and he went to the hospital. And they all they did was X-ray him. They didn't. Um, he wasn't honest with the nurse that he um, actually tore something. Yeah. And so he got septic. They just sent him home because uh, the x-ray showed that nothing was broken, so they sent him home, and he got septic. And um, he fell over here at home, and um, my son Spencer and um, my brothers Max were here, and uh, they, they did everything they could. And at the same time, we were in White Shield at a wedding, my auntie's wedding, and uh, talking to the police police officers, the sheriff, and my, 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 I call, I call my nephew, my son, because I raised him sure. um, on the phone with them. And I think hearing the police officer crying, talking to me, yeah. the EMTs, because I know all these people and I'm very, I close, I work closely with them Yeah, and hearing them cry and telling me that my, my godson, my namesake is gone. Uh, really really took me down hard and to this day i haven't cried over it i haven't cried about it but um uh i've been to counseling and the counselor said that it'll 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 come when it comes it, it's 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 tough but losing uh nicholas was really the toughest thing i went through you know it's okay um, to cry you know i cry yeah, all the, I, I, I i cry I all get, the time when i wake up and i look in the mirror and i go good grief I I gotta go I, out look. <laughs> I think the times I do cry is when I'm by myself. Yeah. When I'm driving on a trip, I'm taking a solo trip to Bismarck or wherever, then I cry. I cry and I talk to them. But um I um thankful I thank them a lot for watching over us because uh it's made me stronger. Yeah. And uh having to go through that and be the strong one of my family, I uh learned that I can get through it. Well, this is what I was going to ask you. What makes you think uh, of the passings of your close ones? What, what, why, why do you think you stayed sober? Is it because be, you knew you didn't want to go down that route anymore? Your no, life, I don't your want life, that. yeah, your I life meant way I, more than that, right? Oh, I have. I don't want to say I have too much to lose. I just, I have um, too many people that look up to me, and I, I, I feel I don't want to. I don't want to ruin that. And I want to be that positive person for everybody, um, for my mom, especially. Yeah. Uh, my nephews, a- my nieces, that they have, they lost parents. They lost their grandparents, the only people that took care of them. And I want them to see that, yeah, I, I grew up without a dad. I, I, my mom was my dad. Yeah. Um, I yeah. just met my dad, but... I could care less if he's ever in my life ever again. Yeah. Because I, I have everything right there in, yeah. my, in the next room is my mother. And that's who I'm strong for. And that's who I get up every morning and I race in there and I kick her bed or I uh, put a mirror underneath her nose and tell her, get up and let's, let's start this day and do this or do that and yeah, go that's somewhere. That's awesome. Well, you're such a power. You're such a strength to so many people that you had mentioned. <laughs> I have to ask you a couple questions more. And uh, sure, do you ever have dreams about relapse? Do you ever have dreams about drinking? And and in my yeah. personal feeling, and I've had some people say, "Oh, isn't that bad if you do?" No, not at all. That's no, your mind you. keeping you fresh. That's yeah. that's your mind telling you, "Hey, pal, you better uh, stay on it because here's what here's a dream I'm going to give you that uh, will will test you." And I always mm-hmm. have these dreams where. I'm thinking about drinking again and I'm looking at the bottle and I relapse and then I wake up and I'm like, thank God that was a dream. Do you ever have those? Oh yes. Those are called nightmares. Those are called nightmares. You better (laughs) believe it. All right. Um, do you have a higher power? Do you have a God? Do you have, do you have someone you believe in? I I believe in God. I, I'm a strong Catholic. I stopped believing when my grandmother passed away in 90, but I, um, I've, Totally got back into praying a lot. Um, well, prayer is uh, you do very that. strong. You've told me you, you do that when you're on your long drives. You talk to people. You talk mm-hmm. to the ones you miss. Yep. 
You you cry because that's a way of healing. The only reason I brought that up, Nicole, and I wasn't trying to be personal or anything, but you know, when uh when you're getting sober, they tell us you need a higher power, and like the, somebody will say, "Hey, either it's that doorknob over there, that's your higher power, or it's a god or whoever, that's your choice." And for me, it's God, and I know yep. that He's the one that saved me and AA. But uh, yeah. I'm so glad that you told me all of that. Um, I just have to tell you, Nicole, you're like one of my heroes. Um, I, well, I know a lot you. of people in the world of sobriety now. And, uh, you know, I've had, the, when I, when you first start out, you've probably heard this where people say to you, hey, you better not hang around those friends anymore. Yeah. You, you know you yeah. can't hang around those people anymore. I get that. <laughs> and I yep. have many people that I don't hang around anymore. For one thing, I'm in Bismarck and they're in San Diego. I do have some <laughs> close friends that I know that still drink, and that's okay because yep. I know my world. Um, so you're one of my heroes because uh, everything you've told me and watching um, your face and your strength uh, at Prairie Nights, and we just recently uh, ran into each other at a memorial of a good friend of ours that passed away. Yes. Uh, and that's when I was able to ask if you'd be on this podcast. It's always so special to see you, Nicole. And uh, I want all your you. friends, of course, I hope your mom and all your friends hear this, and I hope they all nod and agree with me that you are a true walking uh, hero. That's what you are. You are. You have a story to tell, you yep. know? We all have stories. We do. We all have stories, and this is part of the reasons why I, I couldn't wait to put you on as my <laughs> first guest. Do you know that? Well, I thank you very much for asking, and I'm very proud to have done it. Well, you hang on the line real quick with me, okay? I'm just going to wrap this up. That is Nicole. Again, hey, Nicole, thank you again, okay? You bet. You, you give bet. your mom a hug for me, real, okay? I sure will. I sure will. And hang on real quick. Hang on. Don't go. I'm going to wrap it up. And this is why I love putting people on. This is called There Is A Way Out, you know, and you just heard Nicole share her story. I want all to know that if you're on the fence or if you think that you may drink too much or a family member or anybody like that, let them hear these podcasts. Again, I really believe there is a way out. Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy.